is from the book of Ruth, chapter 3, verses 1 through 18. Ruth and Boaz at the threshing floor. If you would like to read along, you may find this passage in the Pew Bibles on pages 414 and then continuing to page 415. One day, Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, should I not try to find a home for you, where you will be well provided for? <coughs> Is not Boaz, with whose servant girls you have been, a kinsman of ours? Tonight, he will be winnowing barley on the threshing floor. Wash and perfume yourself and put on your best clothes. Then go down to the threshing floor, but don't let him know you are there until he has finished eating and drinking. When he lies down, note the place where he is lying. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down. He will tell you what to do. I will do it, whatever you say, Ruth answered. So she went down to the threshing floor and did everything her mother-in-law had told her to do. When Boaz had finished eating and drinking and was in good spirits, he went over to lie down at the far end of the grain pile. Ruth approached quietly, uncovered his feet, and lay down. In the middle of the night, something startled the man, and he turned and discovered a woman lying at his feet. Who are you? he asked. I am your servant, Ruth, she said. Spread the corner of your garment over me, since you are a kinsman redeemer. The Lord bless you, my daughter, he replied. This kindness is greater than which you showed earlier. You have not run after the younger men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do for you all you ask. All my fellow townsmen know that you are a woman of noble character. Although it is true that I am near a kin, there is a kinsman redeemer nearer than I. Stay here for the night. And in the morning, if he wants to redeem, good, let him redeem. But if he is not willing, as surely as the Lord lives, I will do it. Lie here until morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but got up before anyone could be recognized. And he said, let it be known that a woman came to the, excuse me, don't let it be <laughs> that a woman came to the threshing floor. He also said, bring me the shawl you are wearing and hold it out. When she did so, he poured into it six measures of barley and put it on her. Then he went back to town. When Ruth came to her mother-in-law, Naomi asked, How did it go, my daughter? Then she, had ev she told everything Boaz had done for her and asked and added, He gave me these six measures of barley, saying, Don't go back to your mother-in-law empty-handed. Then the Naomi said, 
Wait, my daughter, until you find out what happens. For the man will not rest until the matter is settled today. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> As we left the story last week, Ruth found her, had found a benevolent landowner in the name of Boaz who treated her with generosity. As a result of Boaz's generosity, Ruth was able to glean enough barley to provide a week's worth of food for herself and her mother-in-law, Naomi. Naomi also, at the end of chapter 2, has revealed to Ruth that Boaz, the person who she had been gleaning with that day, was kin to her deceased husband, Eli Mellon. Compared to the end of chapter 1, when Naomi was changing her name to Mara because she was bitter, things were looking up in chapter 2. We also find that Naomi, at the end of chapter 2, told Ruth to stay close to Boaz's servants, servant girls, and, glean, and she gleaned with Boaz's girls until the end of the barley and then the, the end of the wheat uh, harvest, which means that she had spent her first two months in Bethlehem gleaning in Boaz's field. And during this gleaning time, as we read the commentaries, we find that Ruth was probably able to glean enough food that she and Naomi would be able to eat for the rest of the year. However, as we get to chapter 3, the narrator of this story informs us that there's some time that has passed since the end of the wheat harvest and what we're going to read in chapter 3. We are told that one day, Naomi declares that she needs to provide for Ruth's long-term security by finding a husband for Ruth. Yes, the short-term uh, short needs have been met, but Naomi realizes, excuse me, realizes that unless Ruth finds a husband, when Naomi passes away, Ruth will be in a world of hurt. So <clears throat> Naomi decides to find a plan, and she comes up with this plan right here. She notices that Boaz, who is a kinsman redeemer of the family, has already shown some mercy to Ruth in how he treated her during the harvest season. It's logical to Naomi, for Naomi's or it's logical from Naomi's point of view that having Boaz marry Ruth would be the solution to all of Ruth's long-term security needs. She also knows that Boaz will be at the threshing floor this night and will be alone. So she advises Ruth to bathe and to perfume herself. The NIV also says that Ruth is told to put on her very best clothing. However, many of the commentators think that the NIV is reading too much into uh, the Hebrew translation here. Instead, what they say is, Naomi is telling Ruth, it's time to get out of her clothing that she was wearing to symbolize that she was mourning the loss of her husband and put on new clothes that shows that she's back in the market to find a new husband. Once Ruth was appropriately attired, she is to go down to the threshing floor and remain hidden from Boaz until he has finished eating and drinking for the night. If you are wondering, indeed, Naomi is advising her daughter-in-law to wait until the alcohol that Boaz will be drinking with dinner has taken full effect. And uh, in my study uh, this week, I thought about 
deleting this line, but after all the uh, all the hoopla over some some minor wedding that took place yesterday in England, I have to add this line. I know what a shotgun wedding is. It sounds like Naomi here is telling Ruth to have a shot glass wedding. <laughs> but when Boaz falls asleep, Ruth is to notice where he is sleeping, and then she is to quietly go and uncover his feet and then lay next to him. After doing those things, Boaz would then take the lead and tell Ruth what the next step would be. Now, I have to admit, as I read this part of this story, it seems a little bit strange to me, and I'm sure it sounds strange to you, that the way you try to get somebody to marry you is to uncover their feet while they're sleeping. And to be honest with you, the Hebrew text here can be interpreted to mean more than just uncovering the feet. We could have a Hollywood producer turn the story of Ruth into an R-rated movie and still be pretty uh, liberal with the text. And as strange as this may seem to us, it appears that what Naomi is suggesting to Ruth was a common custom of that time to have a woman try to su submit to a man that, you know, it might be a good idea to marry me. The plan Naomi is suggesting, however, is fraught with risk. If this plan backfires, Boaz might end his generosity to Ruth, and Ruth would be in more trouble than she was when she first arrived in Bethlehem. Worse yet, if Boaz wanted to, he could take advantage of Ruth and then claim the next morning that this woman who followed Naomi back to Bethlehem is nothing more than just another one of those Moabite prostitutes who is trying to pollute God's chosen people, just as the Moabite woman did during the history back in the Exodus. This would totally ruin Ruth's reputation. Yet, in spite of the risk, we see that in verse 5, Ruth declares that she will do everything that Naomi said. Both Naomi and Ruth trusted that Boaz was a man of high moral character and would never take advantage of Ruth. Then in verses 7 through 9, we come to the chapter's most suspenseful point. Boaz has eaten and drank his uh, wine, and he has fallen asleep at the far end of the grain pot. Ruth puts Naomi's plan in action during the middle and goes quietly up to Ruth, or Boaz, removes his cloak, and then lays next to him. During the middle of the night, <coughs> something startles Boaz. Now, the story does not tell us what it is that startles him, but I'm going to make two guesses. Guess number one is, if I was Boaz and somebody uncovers my feet in the middle of the night, I'm probably going to wake up because I'm cold. Or the other option is perhaps Ruth is a heavy snorer, and the snoring woke him up. Whatever it was, whatever it is, Boaz is waking up in the middle of the night, and even though it's dark, he notices that there is a woman lying next to him. And I have to put myself in Boaz's position. That would startle me if I went to bed all by myself and then in the middle of the night I wake up and find that there's a woman lying next to me. That would, that would terrify me. Uh, Boaz then asks the obvious question, who are you? Ruth identifies herself 
And then she tells Boaz to spread the corner of his garment over her, as he is a kinsman redeemer. Now remember, a kinsman redeemer was a person who had some obligations to a relative's wife if that relative dies without a son. In asking Boaz to spread his cloak over her, Ruth is asking Boaz to fulfill the obligations of a kinsman redeemer. One thing that the English translations cannot capture is the wordplay that is going on between Ruth and Boaz. Those of you who were here uh, last week, or if you caught the sermon on Facebook, you might remember back in chapter 2, Boaz tells Ruth that he prays that she will be richly blessed by the God of Israel under whose wings you took refuge. Well, the language of under whose wings used by Boaz is the same language that Ruth is now using to tell Boaz to spread the corner of his cloak over her. In other words, she is telling Boaz, be that wing of refuge that you prayed that the God of Israel would provide for me back in chapter 2. The stage is now set. Ruth has made the marriage proposal to Boaz and asked Boaz to take her under his wing. What is Boaz going to do? To take this Moabite woman would involve some risk. And I'm not going to explain what the risk is because that would give away a little bit of chapter 4. So if you want to know the risk, come back again next week and we'll tell you. The question now is, is Boaz going to accept the risk? Or will he be offended by this woman's actions and destroy her reputation? <coughs> the first words of Boaz's mouth probably put Ruth at ease. He declares, the Lord bless you, my God. He goes on to declare that the kindness Ruth has shown is now kinder than, in, than the previous kindness she has shown earlier. Now scholars have debated what previous kindness Boaz is talking about. Is Boaz talking about the kindness that uh, Ruth showed when she went back with Naomi to Bethlehem? Or is Boaz maybe referring to the kindness she showed by staying in Boaz's field and gleaning there for the two harvest seasons? Or my suggestion, whenever I see there are two possibilities, let's add a third. Both A and B are correct. Boaz then gives a hint as to why he did not take the initiative earlier as a kinsman redeemer when he mentions in his blessing of Ruth that she did not run, off, run after younger men. This would hint that perhaps Boaz was significantly older than Ruth and did not believe that Ruth would be interested in having Boaz be her new husband. He then says that he will do what Ruth asks, and he also mentions that to Ruth that there is a, or mentions to Ruth that all the townsmen consider Ruth to be a person of noble character. He then throws a twist into the story. While it is true that Boaz is a kinsman redeemer, there is a closer kinsman redeemer than Boaz. As I read this line, a flood of questions run through my mind. Did Naomi know about this nearer kinsman redeemer? If not, why didn't she know about this person? And if she did know about this nearer kinsman redeemer, why didn't Naomi send Ruth to this nearer kinsman redeemer rather than Boaz? The narrator does not answer this question in chapter 3 and only provides a hint to that question in chapter 4. 
he doesn't even mention who this nearer kinsman redeemer is. Ruth, or Boaz now continues by telling Ruth that in the morning he will give this closer kinsman a chance to do the right thing. But if this closer kinsman redeemer refuses, he definitely will marry Ruth. Either way, whether it's the nearer kinsman redeemer or it's Boaz who takes the responsibility, Naomi's plan to provide for the long-term security of Ruth has been successful in this, in this promise by Boaz. Boaz then informs Ruth to spend the night on the threshing floor with him, and in the morning she can go back to her mother-in-law. The two then wake up early in the morning so that Ruth can make it out of the threshing floor before anyone has the opportunity to recognize Boaz or Ruth and spread some nasty rumors about them. However, before Ruth leaves, Boaz gives Ruth six measures of barley to take back to Naomi. Now, we don't know the exact amount of barley that Boaz gave because it just says six measures and we don't know what measuring cup uh, Boaz is using. But we do know that this gift of barley was intended to be a sign from Boaz to Naomi. Boaz has just promised Ruth that he will make sure that Ruth is taken care of either by the nearer kinsman redeemer or by himself. <clears throat> In providing the barley for Ruth to give to Naomi, Boaz is also promising that Naomi will be provided for also. We have now come to the end of chapter 3. For those who want to know how the story ends, Come back next week, same church time, same church channel, stealing from Batman, of course, and we will find out the end of this story. But the question is, how can we put chapter 3 into application into our own lives? The first thing we can take from this chapter is the importance of integrity. I hinted earlier in my message that there are some sexual overtones found in chapter 3. However, we, we see through the story that these overtones stay just as overtones because of the integrity of both Ruth and Boaz. Integrity also factors into the decisions made between Ruth and Boaz. Let's face it, Ruth probably was fully aware of all the risks that she was taking when Naomi laid out her plan. Naomi likewise knew the risk when she proposed it. The reason that these two ladies could propose and then agree to the plan is because both Ruth and Naomi knew that Boaz was a man of high moral character. Likewise, when Boaz discovers that Ruth is lying with him on the threshing floor, he knew that he did not need to fear what Ruth would do, because he knew, as well as all the townspeople, that Ruth was a woman of noble character. If either Ruth or Boaz lacked integrity, this story would have ended much differently. Let us ensure that we, that we say and do, in all that we say and do, we demonstrate that we too are people of integrity. The second point I think we can apply to our lives <clears throat> is that we need to be people of action. Back in chapter 1, we know that as Naomi is trying to tell Ruth and her sister, stay here in Moab, don't come with me, she then prays that the Lord 
would provide for her two daughters-in-law in the same way that they provided for her when Naomi's husband passed away. Now in chapter 3, we see Naomi designing a plan that would ensure that her prayers will come true for at least Ruth. Likewise, in chapter 2, we see Boaz praying that the God of Israel would provide for Ruth. Here in chapter 3, we see Ruth pointing out to Boaz how he can make his own prayer a reality. It is all well and good for us to pray for things. However, sometimes we need to take some type of action in order for our prayers to be answered. Let me, pro let me propose one hypothetical situation to prove what I'm pointing out. Imagine for a moment that there's a person who is praying to God, God, give me a job, or God, give me a better job. How likely would that prayer be answered in the affirmative if all that this person did was pray, God, give me a job? After all, in order to find a job, normally you have to go out seeking the job. Once you find a job opening, you either have to submit a resume or fill out an application. Jobs just don't fall in your lap because you pray to God that he provides a job. We have to take actions in order to help God fulfill our prayer requests. As we close this message, there are two questions before us. First, are we people of integrity, behaving in a manner that is pleasing to our Lord? If so, that's great. If it's not true, what are we going to do to change our reputation? The other question we need to ask is, are we taking actions that will enable God to answer either our prayers or the prayers of other people in the affirmative. As we have seen from this story of Ruth, God answers prayers. However, he uses all of us to answer those prayers. Let us leave this morning committed to be people who work towards being agents of God answering those prayers. Amen. <laughs> I now would invite you to stand and join us in singing We Praise Thee, O God, page 334.